Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for the May 5th, 2021 edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett. Over the next half hour, we're gonna be taking a deep dive into three important questions we've been hearing from international educators over the last few days. And uh, as we've looked at news stories and themes developing, uh, we're gonna take a deep dive into what uh, some of those trends might mean for what we do here in international education. And as we do always on the Roundup, we want to give a special shout out to obviously those watching live on Facebook every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we also are grateful for those that obviously make the time to watch on repeat, either on the Facebook channel or the YouTube channel uh, for SMIE Consulting. You make uh, certainly make my heart full when I, I see the numbers of, of folks that are watching uh, and digesting this content each week. And also, of course, those that are downloading the podcast each week and making us a regular part of your listening habits. So thank you very much. Uh, it really means the world to me to, to have you as part of the SMIE community uh, to help uh, us all move forward together as we look to uh, overcome the challenges we face in international education. Certainly the last four years, we've had a number of challenges uh, and we've seen a change in how things are operating, uh, certainly from a governmental level in terms of their openness to things international uh, and certainly international students, immigrants, refugees, all of those have been addressed by the new administration in their approach, the, not only their rhetoric, but also putting into action uh, their uh, thoughts uh, and intentions for uh, reopening America to the world, uh, reconnecting with the world. And so we're encouraged by those signs and certainly uh, we've, as we've identified over the last few months, as was the problem last fall uh, in bringing in students to the United States, obviously COVID travel restrictions had a lot to do with it. But in the end, it was students unable to go for visa appointments in the majority. 90% of U.S. consulates were closed last summer at the peak season for students to apply and uh, obtain their documents in order to travel to the U.S. to begin their studies. Uh, we were very uh, certain early on that this was going to be a critical moment coming up this month. And this month of May uh, really leads us into this first question. Is it going to be May? for consulates to reopen. Uh, and yes, that's an aside and uh, the famous May memes that are always popping up this time of year, it's gonna be May uh, by uh, Justin Timberlake and the boys. Uh, so what's, uh, insert, I won't play it for you thankfully, I don't have any pictures to share, but certainly uh, that is a very uh, appropriate way of looking at what we're facing in international education here in the United States is the availability of our consulates to have students come and apply for their student visas. So what we're going to start with today is that question. Is it going to be May for consulates to reopen? And the signs, we've been talking about it for months leading up to this is going to make or break U.S. enrollments this coming fall as to uh, whether we're going to achieve uh, some bounce back. Uh, and anything is going to be an improvement when you think of the numbers, uh, depending on which numbers you look at, 43% of 43% uh, uh, decline in new international student enrollments according to the IIE fall snapshots survey, or do you look at the SEVIS data that is actually counting people who came to the United States where the numbers were actually down 70 plus percent. So uh, we're, we're looking at a, at a fall that can't get any worse, frankly, but what it can do is it can bounce back. And we've seen, and it is all dependent on, uh, we've seen, uh, we'll cover a lot of the stories this week uh, that have given us some hope uh, that things are moving in the right direction uh, in terms of uh, government policy and then consulates reopening. And we'll talk, talk through some of those. There's a, a large number of stories that we are going to be covering for this uh, first, uh, first issue here, uh, first question. And for those who don't, aren't aware, uh, we do have a weekly newsletter that comes out Monday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern on Monday, free of charge to those who wish to subscribe. I'm dropping the link to this current week's edition of the round of the all the SMIE news fit to share, uh, and that's this newsletter uh, title. And you're welcome to subscribe to that from that link uh, that I'm dropping in the comment section on the Facebook page. Otherwise, if you're listening on podcast and you're not yet subscribed or on repeat, uh, do go to SMIE. 
mieconsulting.org slash subscribe, and you'll be able to subscribe and add your name to the mailing list for that newsletter. Because all the stories we cover here on Wednesdays originally come out of that newsletter that we put out on Mondays. Uh, so let's, let's dive right into it in terms of what we're talking about and the positive news we've been seeing. Uh, obviously, when it comes to uh, reopening, I mentioned policies changing, policy, policies being more favorable toward international students. We've seen at least two major policy announcements last week that uh, are shedding some light and some also some consulate news that we'll share in a moment here. Uh, first bit of bright news that uh, certainly ISSS offices were overjoyed this past week uh, when ICE uh, uh, put out their memo uh, continuing their guidance from March 2020, which allowed continuing students to um, remain, uh, that, that, that can remain in status if they are taking online or remote classes. And that can be for students who are uh, still back in their home countries uh, because they couldn't get back into the country or didn't feel safe coming back into the country for, for COVID reasons, that they are able to maintain their status on the way to graduation, not losing OPT time and all those other things that other countries have also done uh, to uh, allow those students who aren't able to re-enter the country to continue uh, and maintain their legal status, F1 status. What it, uh, what it also announced was that this is this guidance that allows students who are continuing to uh, be in the United States and able to take online courses or hybrid courses beyond the one per term that is normally allowed by immigration regulations. And that's a longer term issue that sometime this guidance will, will expire and how will the transition of university courseworks and the way uh, they set up their classes on campus, how will that impact international students moving forward if regulations stay the same? Because this guidance will only be extended for so long. It's not a permanent change. It may, hopefully it would be, and Hart, Larry Bacow at, uh, at Harvard had asked for those kind of changes to be uh, made permanent. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that, but that's, that's another story for another day. But what is really impressive with this guidance, and uh, certainly out of character over the last four years for ICE and for DHS in general, is that it was extended for the entire 2021-22 academic year. So for all students that are, uh, th this is, this is, that are continuing, this is great news. And ISS offices have in the past, certainly during the Trump administration, when these kind of decisions were really last minute things and certainly half-hearted decisions and really weren't done with any circumspectness and um, perspective on things, uh, this is welcome news from ISSS offices. Uh, what is also welcome news that also that helps this facilitate the reentry of students, uh, and there's a couple of articles. There's the Pi News article on this on this COVID guidance, uh, but there's also uh, a, the State Department put out uh, last week on the 26th of April a national interest exemptions for certain travelers from China, Iran, Brazil, South Africa, Schengen area, Schengen area, U UK, and Ireland. So this would, was uh, an issue that was going to but to prevent, um, potentially prevent, because there are still travel restrictions for, uh, for, from, for citizens from these countries that have, uh, for various reasons, uh, were, were on this COVID travel ban list, uh, that uh, students, and this was a narrowly carved out exceptions to this national, to the travel bans for COVID reasons, uh, this national interest exemptions uh, applying to uh, on this list uh, that was put out, China, Iran, Brazil, South Africa, Schengen, UK, and Ireland. Uh, so what that does, uh, did give some hope to is that, okay, because students are, are exempt from these, they can potentially return uh, to study. Uh, both returning students who maybe were uh, uh, trapped at home didn't or left uh, after COVID hits and haven't been able to return, uh, they will now be able to come back uh, into the country because they're exempt from this, uh, the COVID travel ban. So that's encouraging. And that it covers obviously countries that are major senders to the United States. Uh, and that, that's always good news, welcome news. Uh, there was also some concerns as to who was not on this list uh, and uh, what countries were not on this list that uh, that were that was going to was raising some particular concerns, and we we saw late early, early this week actually or over the weekend India was added to this list and in fact State Department has now said and we'll talk about it'll be in the newsletter next week that all countries. Uh, 
that uh, students would be on the national exemption list, interest exemption list, so that they can, uh, regardless of COVID travel bans, they can, because it is in the national interest of the United States, to allow these students into the U.S. So that sends a lot of positive signals, frankly, to overseas students and the parents that we, despite the, tr the, 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 what, the impact the pandemic has had on this world, and travel has certainly been one of the major uh, areas hit by, um, by the restrictions put in place by COVID, uh, there is a signal from the U.S. government that students are valuable enough to the national interest that we're going to allow, even though the country, other countries might be having significant difficulties with COVID uh, flare-ups like India right now, they've announced that uh, students in all these countries are going to be on the NIE list uh, that will be allowed to come to the United States for travel, which is such a uh, an important thing uh, for uh, f to give students hope, frankly, that uh, that they will be able to uh, realize their dream. So we've got the uh, go COVID guidance that for those students that still want to stay stay remote who were who left the country before uh, when the pandemic hit, they'll still be able to continue. Or if their campuses are not yet fully in person, they'll still in the fall they'll still be able to um, maintain their legal status. You've got the an NIE list now that is including uh, all students uh, that were looking to come uh, to begin studies uh, in uh, this fall. Uh, the real challenge now is, as we as we come back to, is the is the consulates. Uh, are they going to be open uh, in order to uh, to uh, allow students to to come for visa appointments and and make their way to the United States? Uh, there are the the concerns. The Chronicle had an article about uh, travel restrictions are lifting. Uh, international enrollments could rebound, but do visa backlogs stand in the way? Karen Fisher's article last week certainly talked to, through a lot of those issues. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, in, encouraging signs. The newsletter had a, had a number of articles on here related to other countries, and there's one that has current status of U.S. visa services by country. Came out on the 29th of April, and again, these these are these are changing things. So in another week, this list could be very different. But it does go in depth in terms of what services are available uh, for a, a lot of these um, of some of these major countries. It's not a, a comprehensive list. There are two. 265 consulates uh, around the world uh, that are potentially open, but this this covers some of the major 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 senders to the United States. So check that out. But the real uh, one that we've all been waiting for, we've heard a couple of weeks ago about uh, consulates and uh, being reopened in India to uh, allow to prioritize and prioritization given to student visas. And that was going to be happening. Obviously, the, there was hiccups, obviously, with a huge spike in COVID cases there and the extreme circumstances they're dealing with in India right now. That consulates had to close for a short time, but they're hoping to reopen. And when they do, they're going to be prioritizing students. Uh, the real question that many, many institutions are asking is, what about China? What about China? Will consulates reopen there? And some are available for emergency appointments only. Again, only within a limited window of time before the program start date. So for students that are looking to start in the fall, they're not in that category yet. It's not an emergency yet that they, they go be able to access appointments. But we did receive word over the weekend, uh, late last week, and that Chinese, uh, that the U.S. Embassy in China is to open visa services on May 4th. So may the force be with us. Uh, it was yesterday, and uh, the restrictions on Chinese STEM students would still be in effect, but uh, that were imposed by the, the Trump administration. But it, embassy would and consulates in China would reopen as of yesterday. Uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled for any news stories uh, indicating uh, whether that's still the case, if they did reopen, and whether they're accepting appointments. But we're dealing with a country that, uh, in a normal year, sends uh, will issue 70, 70 thousand plus student visas uh, that uh, to to students looking to come to the United States or renew visas. The renewal part has been taken care of and that they can renew by mail uh, and deal uh, and get the visa interview waiver, which is has still been in place in many countries. But the for new students, they still have to go physically in, in person to to have their visa interview. So this is great news if it's if it's true and it, and, it can, and it shows and uh, that appointments are, are now being able to uh, be made by prospective students. But the key thing we need to remember is we've got from mid-May here or early May here through to early September to get the equivalent of two years worth of students who are looking to come to the United States through 
for visa appointments. And the lion's share of visas, particularly student visas, are issued in that summer period, May to September. And that's some, going to be a real challenge, obviously, for consulates that may not be yet up to full staffing uh, because of uh, reentry of individuals, uh, staff, uh, U.S. Uh, consulate ind individuals to, to do the appointment. So there's a lot of, a lot of miles to go before we sleep to see if it's, uh, it's going to be possible to get the numbers here that we need that represent basically two years of students that were looking to come to the U.S. So fingers crossed, but the posit signs are certainly positive. We also saw some signs in, that are covered in the newsletter in, uh, in Nigeria, also reopening uh, the largest center uh, that they will be prioritizing student visas this summer. Uh, so that's, that's great to hear. So good news, and hopefully long may it continue into the summer months as, as the student visa season really heats up. So it is going to be May. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to keep, uh, keep my, uh, my optimism meter high on this one that we are going to get through this and that we are going to see uh, rebounding of numbers in the fall as these consulates reopen. So those are po positive signs. Now, also what's positive is when you, the next question that we're asking is what will international students do in order to study? Uh, now, what, there's, a, there's a, been a number of surveys that, even going back to last summer when uh, the questions were asked, well, if you have to quarantine, would you be willing to do that uh, to before, in order to be able to study in person? Uh, a lot of students were, uh, that, were looking, that were able to go to the UK were anticipating in-person uh, instruction but have not gotten that. Uh, but the, I think that's, uh, may have had to quarantine, um, I can't, can't be too sure on what actually happened on the ground. But this is going to be a real uh, potential stumbling block, you would think, for students coming in. Uh, there are the issues of quarantine and the issues of vaccinations and whether students have been able to access them before they arrive in the fall is, is a real question. And if they have a, did, are able to get vaccinations, are they the vac those vaccinations going to be accepted by their colleges or universities that might be, as some institutions have done early on, say we're only going to accept U.S. approved vaccinations. Uh, so that, there's, there's still a lot of details that need to be sorted out. Are there going to be exemptions carved in to those that have already been vaccinated in their home country? Uh, is that going to impact quarantine uh, time that students would have to spend? Who pays for that quarantine time? These are all issues that will still need to be addressed and we'll be on a college by college basis because certainly the U.S. government's not going to be paying for uh, quarantine time and space for any students that come in that are looking to start on campus. That's going to be left to the states. That's going to be left to the uh, local community uh, regulations, state regulations, uh, as well as the individual universities and colleges that are going to be enrolling these students as to what they decide on the quarantine issue and the vaccination issue. So uh, the good news is, uh, despite everything that's happened, the the a lot of the recent survey data, and I'll point directly to uh, IDP Connect's uh, latest data survey, Crossroads 4, that uh, it was an, it's entitled, International Students Remain Willing to Quarantine and Get Vaccinated for an In-Country Experience. And this is the key here. If, they're, if, if these students know that they're going to have an in-country experience of being able to come into your country, study on your campuses, hopefully have in-person instruction, that speaks volumes about their desires to study abroad, to study outside their home countries. And it's up to us as individual institutions, as a country, to, to put, roll out the welcome mat as much as we can and be as clear as we can as a country and institutions as to what our policies are going to be related to international students coming in. And I know there's, it's a moving target still. A lot of campuses that haven't yet made decisions on vaccinations, whether to require them or not, that's going to be hotly debated. Uh, with one community I'm dealing with, uh, schools and university partners, uh, we've put together a Google spreadsheet uh, that uh, shows what individual institutions' policies are related to in-person hybrid classes, related to vaccination policies, where they exist yet. So that's, that's something that we've been doing, and we're very... Uh, we, we know it's important to keep the lines of communication open as, as we move forward. And, and if I can give one piece of advice to my university and college colleagues that are communicating now with their incoming audiences is be very clear. And if you don't know, say that, but give them some, uh, some idea of where you're going and what the timeline is on decisions for these things, because that does matter. Your clarity now will impact their final decisions on whether they're going to be 
willing and able to make that journey if they can get their visas and do all the other pieces that they, they need to in order to come to your campus. So the, the Crossroads data certainly is going to be very encouraging. The majority of the students, 75% uh, that were surveyed here, over 6,000 students were in the survey, 75% uh, expect to commence their studies as planned. Uh, well, we all know the best way plans, uh, what happens there. But uh, the confidence uh, it has dropped overall 5% since their October study on this regard. Uh, some students uh, are, uh, so this drop suggests that some students are growing tired of the uncertainty and the prolonged disruption. And there's an infographic that um, IDP Connects put together. You can download that from the article uh, to get the full details of what's, what to expect. But how you respond now as colleges matters uh, to dispel that uncertainty uh, to uh, prevent further disruption from an institutional perspective to your, your, your new students' lives and be upfront and clear with them about what's, what, they're, what they should expect when they come to you in the fall. One of the, one of the, one of the pieces of advice that uh, certainly the health officials have been given, uh, there's the American College, of health, American College Health Association recommended uh, this past week that uh, all colleges require vaccinations against COVID-19 uh, for those students that are coming to campus this fall. So uh, in order to have uh, the most robust on-campus experience possible. So I think that decision is going to help push, push a lot of institutions over the edge. Uh, we've toured vaccinating, uh, requiring vaccinations. Uh, as we've talked about every week, the Chronicle has a running list of, uh, of colleges. There were, um, a week ago, we were at about 100. We're now over 190 as of Monday this past week. Uh, Monday this week, 209 as of Monday, excuse me. So we're, we're seeing a lot of movement on this front, and I think it's going to be important to, to remember how, uh, how significant this issue will be. Uh, for uh, for students, but uh, knowing I'm working on all the details still, there's a lot of a lot of miles to go before they get to your campus. But figuring out something that makes sense, you can be transparent about, and you can communicate early enough in the process. I think is going to be what will really set yourself apart and 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 give the confidence to those students that frankly are have been dealing with disruption in their own lives, their own countries, and they're just needing some clarity. And this is what you can provide them. Uh, when you make these decisions and, and can back them up and be clear with them. So uh, certainly some positive signs all the way around and positive that uh, the, you know, the country is moving in the right direction here in terms of policies, that uh, consulates are beginning to reopen, and also positive in that students are willing to make sacrifices in order to make their dreams of studying in the U.S. come true. So uh, one country that has really almost shut up shop when it comes to bringing students in uh, is Australia. New Zealand and China are, other, are two others and have other different circumstances, but the impact of our, the government policies in Australia to really not consider reopening yet to international students other than small groups of PhD mostly that were coming in to finish their programs, uh, the impact of that is going to have is going to be felt for years to come, and has already been uh, felt at the university and college level in Australia with massive layoffs, where more than any other country they've seen significant uh, cuts. On average, 430 jobs per university have been cut in the past year as a result of COVID. Uh, in the U.S., we're about 144 per campus, so much lower rates, and that's over the breadth of the of the institutions in the United States. Uh, so there's real uh, been been real devastating impacts on campus communities in Australia. Uh, there have been signs, and we'll point to a couple of articles this week. Uh, first up uh, is that there are signs that it's not going to be getting any better anytime soon. That uh, a recent survey uh, suggests that more than 40% of international students will defer until they can return on campus. Uh, and that's a significant, uh, significant factor that a lot of students are just simply not willing to do uh, that started their degree online, hoping it was going to be a semester, maybe a year before they could come to campus to continue their studies, are now finding it's going to be two years before they can come to campus, minimum two years before they can come to campus. And again, these are students that were looking to start last, last school year, beginning of Mar February, March uh, in Australia. Uh, that 
that's uh, and the key here is 39 percent of the of these students that were in the survey uh, indicated they were likely to switch destinations switch country destinations if it meant that they could access in-person study earlier so there is real uncertainty uh, in, and flexibility, frankly, in international students in terms of where they're willing to go right now because of the impact of the pandemic and the unwillingness of certain countries to reopen in, an, in, a, in a manner that seems to be doable uh, in, in terms of the protections and, and uh, safeguards that can be put in place to allow a, a smooth return to normal, somewhat normalcy in terms of entry of uh, new students of, uh, and returning students. So it's really interesting to see how Australia continues to not show any signs of life. Uh, I mean, institutionally, colleges and universities in Australia, there's only 40 universities, less than 40 universities in Australia. They've been forced to really think outside the box and go all in on these study hub uh, ideas and uh, to embrace transnational education in a way that they perhaps weren't doing and as much as maybe the British have over the, over the last couple decades. Uh, so Australian institutions have, have been forced to look at online at de delivery of education as kind of the norm to get them through this. Uh, and there aren't signs, they're not signs that they're getting, uh, signs of life really uh, from the government or signals from the government that it's gonna be different anytime soon, certainly not before 2022. Those, they've been saying that for the last few months now, 2022 is the earliest that students will be allowed, international students will be allowed in, in bulk. So uh, this, is, this is really uh, certainly bad news for Australia. We also see uh, the, another survey, in, uh, same survey, IDP Connect survey, set, showed that only 7% of international students are willing to complete Australian courses online, survey shows. So of those students that started their degrees in the last year, year, year and a half with Australian institutions, less than se only 7% of those international students will, complete, will would complete their full degree online because that's not what they signed up for. That's not what they wanted. Uh, so that's, uh, and that speaks, I think, to the importance of that on-campus experience for internationals. And that really resonates as the motivations, the pull factors of studying in another country and what that's going to mean for them down the road in terms of job opportunities and career progress. All of that is going to be hugely important to international students. So we'll keep our fingers uh, on this uh, uh, on the pulse of this as we as we move into the summer months, our summer months, their winter months, as to what uh, if there's going to be any significant change. Now, universities really the government gave them a small bailout last year. Uh, there's not really been any support for them, but an uh, additional support for them coming from the government. Uh, but what we have seen is Australian government pumped uh, has now uh, announced uh, 53 million Australian dollars, about 40. Five, 46 million uh, US dollars into international education. This money is not for higher education. Uh, this, uh, in terms of universities, it is for international education providers in the country. Uh, and that, uh, they've defined that in this article, uh, the Pi News article, is targeting English language programs that have been absolutely devastated over the last year and a half. Uh, by the pandemic, and it's also non-university higher education providers to attract more Australians, and they're being told uh, they're being told to uh, attract more Australian students uh, to make up uh, so and do short courses. So this is uh, they uh, this is something that uh, they're they're not no new that means no new international students are coming to them. Uh, and that the government is saying, hey, we're not anticipating any, any uh, change on the horizon here, so you need to change your, your focus in terms of who your target audience is, that you need to be looking more at Australian students and other short-term markets on online delivery of your, of, your, of your programs. So it's really forcing a huge rethink in the non-university higher ed sector in Australia, uh, particularly in English language, as we've said, and every uh, English language destination uh, has suffered in terms of their IEPs. Uh, have really just nosedived even more than they already were with a decline in government scholarship programs over the last four or five years. So some really uh, some challenging times in Australia, obviously for higher education as a whole. Uh, internationally, uh, they've taken huge hits. 
uh, even though that their numbers show that 77% of, um, of students stayed in, in Australia. That was returning students, but new students certainly are not in that mix. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, damage that's been done in Australia and no signs that the government is willing to do anything to uh, change, change that, turn that around anytime soon. So my uh, heart certainly goes out to, uh, to our colleagues in Australia who've been, uh, who are dealing with this right now because it's, uh, it's no, not, fun to be an, no, not a fun time to be an international educator in Australia, I'm sure. And to colleagues that work in uh, service industries connected to that, uh, certainly you've, you've seen some, uh, some significant uh, hits to what you do as well and are maybe forcing you to change uh, markets in terms of where you're looking to expand your, your services. So a uh, lot of uh, moving parts, obviously, in, in, this, in the impact the pandemic's had on different countries. But as we move through uh, the next few weeks, we'll have more, more details on consulate reopenings, and we'll talk through that process and, and in terms of what students are willing to do. So what is next for, for Australia? So we'll see what happens uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, for now, that's all we have on the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup, and look forward to chatting with you again soon. Have a great week.